Good. Okay, so I'm happy to introduce Professor Stefan Prohaska, whom I met for the first time, I think, in 2005 uh in vienna as an organizer of the on, of a conference on arabic dialects and um, uh, he is a professor at the institute for oriental studies of the vienna university and um, has uh, published a lot uh, on the arabic dialects mostly as far as i know the dialects of uh, the region of uh, Turkey and Syria, and but not only, also Tunis and Iraq, and you may uh, add something <laughs> uh, if I forgot. Um, and uh, also, uh, Professor P Professor Stefan Prohaska um, is um, um, uh, has projects at his university related to Arabic dialects, and one of these projects I can recommend it's Vienna corpus of Arabic varieties, so which uh, um, uh, includes uh, dictionaries uh, and um, uh, corpora of texts uh, and uh, other things, and um, a book, uh, um, a <clears throat> textbook on the, Syriac di on the Syrian dialect, um, dialect of Damascus, as far as I know. Uh, so, um, Professor Stefan Pochaska is a uh, a uh, well-known uh, dialectologist, I would say, and uh, I think we are happy to uh, that he uh, um, uh, agreed uh, to um, take uh, to to <clears throat> make a lecture, to make a talk uh, today for the students of the High School of Economics. Okay, thank you very much, Vera, for your very kind words. And uh, yes, I think it was in 2005 uh, for the AIDA conference that we met for the first time. Uh, and we have been in contact since then, for, uh, which is very nice. And uh, I also would like to thank Professor Irina Tsarekodrotseva for her kind invitation. I am really happy for the opportunity to present uh, a paper on dialectology to the students in Moscow. But, uh, Frankly speaking, I would be much happier to give my lecture at your university and to speak in front of you. But as we all know, the circumstances do not allow this uh, at this time, hopefully another time. Yes, we will be glad to, uh, to invite you to Russia one day, really. Yeah. I, I was in Moscow, but unfortunately only one day. <laughs> so it, uh, I would like to see your wonderful city again. Uh, yes, uh, so my lecture, so I will start now my presentation. Uh, uh, my lecture will is dedicated to Arabic dialectology, which is a field that lies a little bit on the margin of Arabic studies. But nevertheless, I am convinced that uh, the dialects play a key role, not only for understanding the contemporary Arab culture, but also if we want to learn more about the history of the Arabic language, which is still loaded with many myths. So the subjects of my lecture I will speak about uh, uh, in the next hour uh, are some myths that are connected to the origin of Arabic and which still have a great impact on the development of this language the classification of Arabic dialects and the question if they are really only corrupted forms of classical Arabic, the genesis of today's dialects and their aerial distribution, and finally some thoughts on the linguistic typology of uh, the Arabic dialects. So uh, well, I'm so sorry, uh, we still can't uh, see your presentation. Okay, sorry. You, can you see it now? Uh, not yet, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, now? Yes, it is. Can you see it? Yes, okay. yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Okay, and now you can see it? Yes, it's fine. Uh -huh. That's good because now I can see you and the, and, uh, 
and the presentation. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, when we talk about myth, one usually is thinking about the distant past. Uh, however, you might be surprised um, when I begin my paper by going so far back in the mythical past as the two people shown here. The reason is that Adam and Eve can be held responsible for many myths and not a few facts regarding the Arabic language. According to the classic books written by Arabs on the Arabic language, not only do the angels converse in Arabic, but Arabic was in fact the language by which Adam talked with Eve. So we can, that, uh, we can imagine that uh, Adam asked Masmuki, Ismir uh, Hawa. In the famous work on linguistics by the 15th century uh, author Asuyuti, we can read. Inna Adam alayhi salamu kana lughatuhu fi al-jannati al-arabiyyata falamma asa sallabahu allahu al-arabiyyata fatakallama suriyaniya So this means that God punished Adam by taking away his ability to speak Arabic. This means after leaving the Garden of Eden for the secular world, Adam and Eve lost the celestial language and began to talk in a corrupt idiom, which the Arab grammarians label as a kind of Arabic dialect, mostly as Syriac, that means Aramaic. But uh, Stefan, uh, unfortunately, uh, your uh, screen is not seen and your voice is uh, turned off. Uh, could you please uh, switch on uh, the microphone? There is uh, a disconnection. Uh, can the others see the screen of uh, yes. Stefan? Yes, so now, yes, we can, can hear you. Hear me again? Uh, yes, could you please uh, switch on your presentation again? Yes, yes. So it told me that there was a, con a break. <laughs> yes, this connection. So happens, I hope it yes. will not happen again. <laughs> yes, inshallah. Yeah. So, sorry. I don't know why this is, but. Uh, We had uh, problems today. Okay, so now here we are. You see it again? Yes, we see the miss okay. now. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyway, when God saw that at least uh, some of the Arabs were developing in the right direction, that means uh, toward monotheism, he sent the archangel Gabriel whom you see here, uh, to Abraham's son Ismail to teach him pure Arabic again. So this is myth number two. The next myth is connected to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. He was chosen by God as his last messenger, the seal of the prophets, and God transmitted the Quran to him. According to Islamic belief, the Quran is the last holy script which will ever be given to mankind. And it is, as stated in Surah 16, a book in clear Arabic. Uh, in the Arab world, it is common sense that the language of the Quran is not only identical with Muhammad's idiolect, but also with the dialect of his tribe, the Quraysh. This is, however, a kind of dogma which was postulated several centuries after the death of Muhammad. There is a saying of uh, Muhammad uh, in the early philological word, works, the Quraysh were never among those people who were called Afsah al-Arab, the Arabs with the purest language. Quite the contrary, there is a saying of the prophet 
which uh, where we can read أنا أفسح العربي بيد أني من قريش which means I speak the best and purest Arabic although I am from the tribe of Quraysh. And only in later works, we can read that in this sentence, the Arabic conjunction by the Anna does not mean although, but because. So the myth could go on and it has been perpetuated until the 21st century. Hence, uh, all ancient and many modern Arab writers stress the unique position of Arabic among all the languages of the world. They praise its beautiful sounds, its overwhelming richness of vocabulary, the perfect writing system in which each character corresponds to one single sound. So what could be better for a student who is interested in the Middle East than to learn this sacred language? the common speech of all Arabs from Oman to Mauritania, the language which possesses one of the richest written literatures of the world. Years after, of, after almost breaking his or her larynx with learning nearly a dozen different guttural sounds, after studying a complicated morphology and strange syntactical structures, and all this in a complex script which runs from right to left, this student books a flight to, let's say, Tunisia. Upon arrival, delighted to be here, there, she or he wants to see the famous old town of Tunis, and in the language, which is sacred for and shared by all Arabs, asks a passerby. Ya Sayyidi, أي شارع يؤدي إلا باب البحر؟ The polite Tunisian, with a puzzled look at the student, responds, Qu'est-ce que vous voulez, madame? The student, likewise puzzled, repeats the original question in a simpler form. باب البحر, no response. Finally, the completely baffled student shows the proud citizen of Tunis a picture of the Bab al-Bahr in a guidebook. Eventually, the Tunisian Arab understands the, the tourist's question and says, à la porte de France, mshi à la tour. So, what happened to the student? Did he mistakenly ask a French tourist, or was his pronunciation really that bad? Neither. The reason for the confusion was that the common idiom of all Arabs Al Arabiya al Fusha is normally not used when asking somebody for directions or while shopping in the market. If the students had used the local dialect form of Port de France, Bab al Bahr, instead of Bab al Bahri, the man probably had understood the question, but not in this classical sound shape. So, standard Arabic, we can say. Uh, a sort of modernized variant of the speech of Aden is almost exclusively used for written communication and for formal speech. On all other occasions in daily life, people communicate in one of the numerous local and regional dialects. This means the elderly man in Tunis probably understands standard Arabic, but most people do not expect its usage in informal speech and therefore sometimes do not get the meaning immediately. But how do Arab scholars explain the, the fact that nobody in the Arab world, neither in Baghdad nor in Tunis in, or in Casablanca actually speaks a variety of Arabic which is similar to the language of the holy book? It is clear that in the Arabs' own side, they are not themselves responsible for this gap between the ideal and the linguistic reality. For centuries, Arab scholars have blamed what they regard as the corruption of the pure language upon the non-Arab peoples of Syria, Egypt, and Iran, who, after their conquest by the Muslim armies, were unable or unwilling to learn Arabic properly. 
that what have been left of Arab culture and its noble speech among the educated classes was finally destroyed during the four centuries of Turkish rule over Arab lands. So this is how many educated Arabs still see the history of their language. The fact that a codified written language exists side by side with local dialects is certainly not a phenomenon which is unique to Arabic. But what makes the case of Arabic so special is that the phonology and morphology of standard Arabic have not changed for more than a thousand years. Its rules are believed by its speakers to be based on a sacred text of divine origin. But coexisting with this divinely inspired language are countless local dialects which have developed naturally without any normative rules and almost without the influence of written varieties. So in contrast to many other speech communities, their usage is not determined by social classes. They are spoken by everybody, from the illiterate farmer to the president of the state. So you can still find a video, for instance, on YouTube, where you can hear the former king of the second. Assuming that the cameras are switched off, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, it's okay. Huh? Okay, so assuming that the, uh, that the cameras are switched off, he talks to his minister in a register of Moroccan Arabic, which is really very vulgar and low and absolutely unworthy of a king. But it shows us even the king, when not in an informal setting, speaks the Moroccan dialect. Maybe it's worth mentioning that under the rule of the same king, a man was sentenced to one year of jail because he wrote a letter to the king in the dialect, which is a, kind, a, a sort of Lee's majesty. So we have the written Arabic, Quranic Arabic, classic Arabic, modern standard Arabic, which with this prescriptive grammar, which has, uh, as I told you, not changed over more than a thousand years and uh, with a, a language which is usually used in formal contexts. And then you have the spoken varieties, no rules, and language change as in many other languages of the world, or all languages of the world, and usually used in informal contexts, which includes writing in the social media. So let's uh, have a look at the classification of the Arabic dialects. So the, the biggest difference between the dialects and the standard language is, uh, as you may all know, uh, that the dialects do not have case and mood endings. Uh, that means they lack the i'rab, which is so important for the Arab grammarians. Moreover, in many dialects, also phonological changes have taken place. The Arabic dialects are often divided into two large groups, which are not related to aerial, but to social criteria. This is the split between the Bedouin dialects and the sedentary dialects. Today, of course, uh, this dichotomy is rarely related to the actual way of life of the people, but a mere linguistic category that means Many people who speak a Bedouin type dialect live now in big cities. A good example for that is the dialect of the city of Baghdad. The Bedouin dialects are characterized by the shift of the uh, letter Qaf to G. So the Arabic word Qalb, heart, is pronounced Galb or Galib. Yeah, the, they all they also have a typical velarization of the law in the Bedouin dialects, whereas in the sedentary dialects, the people either say Qalb or Alb, which shows this typical urban sound shift from Qaf to Hamza.
Besides this social division, we can differentiate five large dialect groups which are geographically distributed. The Arabian Peninsula, Mesopotamia, so Iraq and Anatolia, Syria and uh, Palestine, Egypt and Sudan and Chad, and the Maghreb, the North African dialects. Uh, his, historically, the Arabic was also spoken in Sicily and in Spain, and we have some language islands also in Uzbekistan and in Afghanistan, uh, where Arabic is spoken by uh, a few thousand people. And Arabic, Arabic has also spread into Central and uh, Eastern Africa to Uganda and Kenya, but in a uh, uh, creolized, in a pigeonized variety, uh, Kinubi and other Kiturki and other languages. So this is not really Arabic, it's a Creole language. Uh, yes, so uh, the dialects from different regions are mutually not easily understandable. This does not mean that uh, somebody from Iraq does not understand somebody from, let's say, Tunis, because the people know, know how to communicate because they all were in school or they have this satellite uh, TV. But if, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a peasant, uh, a farmer from Iraq who was never in school comes to Tunis, he would not uh, understand it. And uh, I was, once was in Syria uh, in, a, in, a, in the cinema where they played a Tunisian film and it, it had subtitles because people in Syria do not understand Tunisian Arabic. Uh, so in, uh, I want to show you the big differences uh, uh, with this uh, So what are you, uh, how are you fine? What are you doing? So in, in Sana'a, this is كيف حالش بخير ما بتسوي ذالحين in Iraq شلونج زينة شتسوين هسا in Damascus كيفك منيحة شو عم تاوي هلا in Egypt إزايك كويسة بتعملي ايه دلوقتي in Tunis, شنو حوالك لباس ايش تعمل توا and in Casablanca, كي دايرة لباس شنو كديري دابا so if you have only a look at this map and these sentences you would hardly suggest that this is the same language but all people who utter these sentences would tell you that they speak Arabic so you at first sight, you notice a striking difference in vocabulary. Uh, we, there are six completely different words for now. Valhin, Hella, Hassa, Dilwaati, Tawa, and Daba. And five different words for good. Uh, uh, you have Kwayissa and Zena and Miha. And here the people say Bihair and here Labes. And still three different forms meaning to make. So if you compare this, for instance, with the Slavonic languages, you will find much less variation. Uh, so as far as I know, words like how and good sound very similar in Russian, Bulgarian, Serbian, Czech, and other Slavonic languages. But these are different languages. But in Arabic, as I told you, it's all Arabic, but nevertheless, you, show, you, you have these huge uh, differences. So besides uh, lexical differences, you also notice grammatical features in these sentences. For instance, uh, that in San'a and in, uh, in, in Baghdad, uh, no, in, in, in Damascus, you have uh, a kind of aspect marker, Amtawi, what are you doing now, Bitsawai, and also in uh, Moroccan Arabic, they use Ke uh, to uh, express uh, uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing action. 
uh, or in Egyptian Arabic, you see this peculiarity that the interrogative pronoun is after the verb. So what, what, uh, you do what? In, in all other dialects, the word for what is the first verb. Uh, okay, so uh, this means uh, that what, what happened here? This, in the view of many contemporary scholars, the dialects are only distorted mixtures of uh, Arabic and uh, mixtures of Arabic and non-Arabic elements which have no grammatical rules uh, in, and, and so on. But if you have a look at these words, there is not one, not even one word which we cannot explain out of Arabic. All these words are Arabic. There are, there are no non-Arabic elements here, even in Morocco or in Tunisian Arabic. All these words have developed, have emerged from the Arabic language. So, uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, so uh, there are even, so this is, actually a myth that uh, the dialects are only corrupted uh, forms of Arabic. There are even not a few counter examples which have no, which are strikingly show that the dialects have actually preserved ancient patterns which have been replaced by innovations during the codification of classical Arabic in the eighth and in the ninth century. In short, with regard to some linguistic features, today's dialects are closer to the language of the Quran uh, and, and standard Arabic uh, and standard Arabic. I will give you now two examples. Agreement. Agreement rules in classical Arabic are relatively complex, but they are strict and do not leave much room for variation. Two of the most important rules are plural heads, which do not denote human beings, agree with family singular, al buyut kabira, and not kibar. Verbal predicates, which precede the nominal subjects, are always in singular, dakhla at tulab ad dars, and not dakhalu. In most dialects, we find much complex systems, which leave it open for the speaker to make pragmatic decisions. Here, some examples from Tunis Arabic. In Tunis Arabic, here uh, you see six sentences uh, in the Arabic dialect of Tunis. And you see here the word nas, people, uh, combined with a verb in the plural, the people started to come. But in the next sentence, you see that the same word is combined with the feminine singular. Or in the next sentence, the houses in the neighborhood are expenses. So Ralin is plural, although Dar is uh, the word for house is not a human. But in the next sentence, you find the same word combined with feminine singular. And we have two big problems, plural, plural, but we have big problems. So what do we see here? In short, the plural Plural agreement is used when the speaker wants to express that the plural is, uh, co is, uh, includes the individuals. So it's a, so individual uh, uh, people here or individual problems. So if you have two problems, you know the two problems. It's not a collective. Uh, and here in the, in the houses in our neighborhood, you know these houses, but so all the houses are, uh, are expensive, just means that you, you mean there is no difference between the, 
the houses and uh, so it is a collective and the same here so we have big problems and you do not think about each problem separately so this is very interesting and actually you find uh, very uh, similar sentences in the old Arabic poetry you find such sentences in the Quran so it is in this case it is not the dialects but it is the standard language that shows innovation with uh, regard to old Arabic. A second uh, example is uh, the dot. Probably you have already heard that Arabic is often also called lughat a dot. So far, so good. But why of all sounds dot? Why not ayn, which is often regarded as typical for Arabic? Actually, dad is not more peculiar than sod or ta. It's one of the realized consonants. If we take a look at this sketch of Arabic sounds, which ultimately goes back to Siva Wahi, the great grammarian of Arabic, we find all consonants in the position where we assume they have to be. So we see seen here near the sod and uh, the ta is near the ta and the da and the and and so on but here you have the da dal dal and dal but the dot is not here uh, like the ta and the sod the dot is here uh, here you have the dot so it is the dot is uh, in the vicinity of ye and sheen and jim and uh, the reason for that is, and you see also interestingly, the, it is uh, close to the lamb. Uh, the lamb is here and a little bit backwards is the dot. And here then you have the guttural consonants, ha, rain, ha, ein, and so on. Uh, so uh, the reason for the, this is that dot was a very peculiar sound indeed a velarized lateral sibilant. A proof of its lateral character is found in Arabic loanwords in Spanish. In, if you know Spanish, a mare uh, is uh, called in Spanish alcalde, which is derived from alcadi, uh, actually meaning, uh, so, but uh, we think it is uh, suggested that in Andalusi Arabic, Al-Qadi was uh, pronounced Al-Qadli, uh, and then the L uh, by metathesis changed its posi position. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago, a young Saudi linguist, Munira Al-Azraqi, went for fieldwork to the Asir region in Saudi Arabia. There, in some mountain villages, she made recordings and found out that elderly people have a very uncommon pronunciation of dot. After making a phonological analysis, she could tell us it is exactly the way how Siba Wahi and other famous grammarians described this sound. It's, uh, I will try uh, to pronounce it, it's sh, sh, uh, sh, a velarized sh with a lateral. So a few remote dialects have preserved this very archaic sound and provided us with an explanation why Arabic was named after this and not a, a, another consonant. Now I would like to say a few words on the genesis of today's dialects. This map, uh, shows the linguistic situation of Arabia before Islam. We can see that Arabic was not only spoken on the peninsula, but also by tribes in what is today Jordan and Syria and Iraq. It is believed that these tribes who lived on the edges on the, of the Fertile Crescent spoke a different type of Arabic even centuries before Islam. This type of modern Arabic spread along the trade routes is particularly along the Frank Incense route uh, and uh, probably may have reached Mecca by the time of the Prophet. 
So this could explain the above mentioned assertions of the older grammarians that Muhammad spoke the best Arabic in spite of being a member of the Quraysh tribe. Many uh, scholars still believe in the family tree model. That means they are convinced that the medieval and modern dialects are direct offshoots of classical Arabic. For them, the expansion in the, ninth, in the seventh century was the reason that more and more native speakers of Arabic adopted a simplified language as the result of the wrong Arabic spoken by the newly conquered people. But this view is, much, is too simple. Firstly, because it overestimates the role of the substratum languages. Substratum influence outside the lexicon is only attested for very few cases and restricted to certain regions. Secondly, and more important, because the Arab soldiers who conquered the whole Middle East and North Africa did certainly not speak one poetic koine, nor did they speak classical Arabic. Their everyday language uh, was the numerous old Arabic dialects, which the Arab grammarians quite often refer to. Although our knowledge of these old dialects is rather limited, it can be said that most probably not even the early dialects of the Islamic era were direct offshoots of certain old Arabic dialects. So this means neither the family tree, which you see here on the left, nor the family tree on the right can explain what happened linguistically during the first centuries of Islam. The emergence of the Arabic dialects was certainly more complex. Uh, so let's uh, see uh, another explanation. Uh, we can assume that in the center, in Arabia, it was uh, indeed that old Arabic dialects uh, that they continued to be spoken and they uh, resulted in medieval Arabic dialects and then modern Arabic dialects. For instance, we find the Kashkasha, which means that the people say, for instance, Baitish instead of Baitik. This is something which uh, the Arab grammarians report uh, for, uh, for the 7th century. And it is still found in Yemen and in Oman, uh, as you have seen in the uh, example from Sana'a, where people say uh, kaif halish uh, and not kaif halik. But outside of Arabia, in the periphery, uh, it, uh, so it is assumed that the speakers of many old Arabic dialects, they mixed in the new cities in Damascus, in Kufa and in Basra, in, uh, uh, in Fustat, in Kairouan, in Tunisia and in Fez. So uh, we can say that the Arabic dialects are polygenetic uh, and some of them uh, have maybe developed from old Arabic dialects, but for many the family tree can not be used uh, uh, as an explanation. The Bedouins who stayed in Arabia, uh, their dialects were uh, certainly more conservative. So uh, they only later adopted the features of the modern language type. I mean, the language type without the Arab. So in the books of the Arab grammarians, we can read that in search for the pure Arabic, the grammarians of the 8th and 9th century, they did fieldwork among the Bedouins. And from their findings, we know that in remote areas of the Arabian Peninsula, there were still people who spoke a language which was at least near uh, classic or let's say uh, uh, old Arabic. But we can be sure that by the 10th century at, le at latest, no Arab spoke as his or her mother tongue a language which had case and mood endings and the like. And it is in, at that, in that time that um, the grammarians wrote uh, books which deal with the mistakes 
of the ordinary people. This is a genre which is called the Lahan al Awam literature, like uh, this book you can, which you can here see, see here by Ibn Hisham al Lahn. The authors of these books lament that few and fewer people are able to speak or write proper Arabic. They present long lists of common mistakes, lists which are valuable indirect sources for how Arabic was spoken a thousand years ago. But otherwise, data for older layers of spoken Arabic are very, very scarce. So because Arabic, the Arabic of the Quran was regarded a holy language, it was the aim of all educated people to preserve the Arabic language as it had been spoken in the glorious days of the prophet. There is only, so, because of the dominant position of this sacred language, no development towards making spoken varieties to languages has ever been undertaken. So we find nothing comparable uh, as uh, the emergence of Italian, French, Spanish, or Portuguese as languages on the expense of Latin. The only exception uh, is Maltese. So Maltese uh, it was actually in the 12th century an Arabic dialect, uh, which has uh, become a real language, as a language which is the official language of uh, the uh, Republic of Malta and uh, therefore also one of the official languages of the European Union. Why this? The, the reason is very simple. Maltese has always been spoken by Christians who never had any cultural ties to other Arabs. So all these myths about the sacred language were, were not uh, for them not important. And of course, uh, if you ask people from Malta, they would deny to say that their language has anything to do with Arabic. So Maltese is a language on its own and many Maltese people think that their language is actually uh, not, uh, has not emerged from Arabic, but from Punic. Uh, so this means also that uh, we do not have written evidence of the language which was actually spoken by the normal people. And thus, uh, diachronically seen, there is a gap of roughly 1,000 years. So from the beginning of uh, the 8th to the end of the 18th century, there are only very few sources which can give us an idea of how Arabic may have looked like. So uh, the only exception is Andalusi Arabic, uh, for which we have many sources. But unfortunately, this is the only dialect which have ceased to be spoken because Al-Andalus has uh, uh, become uh, 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 Spanish uh, spoken uh, country. Uh, interestingly, one of the first uh, uh, scientific descriptions of any Arabic dialect was published in Vienna in the year uh, 1800. It, it was uh, a book a description of the dialect of the city of Tanga in Morocco, and uh, it was written in, the Lat in Latin uh, by an Austrian diplomat uh, called uh, Franz uh, uh, von Dombay. Okay, so. Uh, so now just a few words about uh, the distribution of the dialect. So on the whole, the distribution of the dialects resembles that of other speech communities. Uh, that means in mountainous areas, we have a very fragmented picture, which dissimilated dialects often being spoken in adjacent valleys, whereas in plains or hill countries, the same or at least very similar dialects are usually spoken over extended areas. Long Along trading routes and especially in large cities, the leveling of dialects can often be noticed. 
But there are also differences between uh, the Arab uh, dialectal landscape and that of other languages. So we have some puzzling linguistic settings. For instance, extreme differences between the dialects of certain towns and their hinterland. So, so then uh, similarities between dialects which are far away from each other. For instance, there are similarities between Moroccan and Yemeni dialects. And uh, other uh, puzzling settings like a very sharp dialect border in the Nile Valley near Asyut. So uh, many of these surprising settings are the result of the large scale migrations of the Bedouins. So the contrast and conflict between the Bedouins and the town and village people is a main theme of the history of the Middle East and North Africa. And there is a sharp distinction between the Bedouin and the sedentary dialects, as I mentioned before. And because of their mobility, so the Bedouins often they, they, they wandered, uh, they moved for, for many, many hundred kilometers, uh, the Bedouin dialects are often quite homogeneous over large areas. For instance, the so-called Shawi or Gili type Bedouin dialects are spoken from the gates of Aleppo to the Persian Gulf, so up to uh, Basra. So in, in this huge area, which uh, spans over a distance of more than 1000 kilometers, uh, dialects which are easily mutually understandable are spoken. Uh, in North Africa, the differences between the sedentary and Bedouin dialects are even more extreme because uh, in uh, this region, there were two waves of Arabization. So the first, the first Arabs came in the seventh and in the eighth centuries, but they reached only the towns and their surroundings. And uh, so that means that uh, for many centuries, Arabic was only spoken in the larger towns and not on the countryside. Only with the second wave of Arabization in the 11th and 12th century, uh, which uh, a migration of uh, large Bedouin tribes of the Banu Hilal and the Banu uh, Sulaim, uh, this led to the Arabization of the plains and the highlands. And therefore, for example, uh, in Tunis, the dialect of an original city dweller and his neighbor who comes from southern Tunisia are more different than uh, this Bedouin's dialect is from a Bedouin who lives in Mauritania, which is 2,500 kilometers away. So this is really uh, something which you cannot find in other linguistic settings because uh, their nomadism, nomadism is so strong in the Arab world. Uh, another uh, example uh, is the city of Baghdad. So the, the, the kernel of the Arabic dialect of Baghdad is actually uh, a dialect of the sedentary type. But uh, in the 13th century, in 1250, 58, uh, the Mongols destroyed Baghdad and killed most of its inhabitants. So in the following centuries, Baghdad was a rather small city and uh, Baghdad itself and the southern Iraq were resettled by Bedouins from Arabia. And therefore the old Mesopotamian uh, dialect type has been replaced by Bedouin type Arabic. But in Baghdad itself, this happened only with the Muslim population. Why? Because the Muslims, they intermarried with the newcomers uh, from uh, the countryside. But the Jews and the Christians who lived in Baghdad, they preserved their old dialect. And uh, therefore in Baghdad, at least until the 1950s, we found a very unique situation that the, the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians spoke uh, very different 
dialects. Uh, as I have already mentioned, the Bedouin dialects are uh, characterized by the shift from Qaf to Gaf, but the urban dialects, they often show Qaf to glottal stop. And uh, uh, this is also an in intriguing uh, characteristics of Arabic dialectology that you find urban features uh, spreading from one city to the other. Uh, look, we find this of uh, uh, pronunciation like alb or ammar uh, for moon. In Aleppo, uh, we find it in Beirut, uh, in Jerusalem, in Cairo, Alexandria. Uh, and we also find it in Maltese and we find it in Fez. Uh, so, but not in between, and we do not find it in Arabia, where we do not have large cities, and we also do not find it in Baghdad, because uh, Baghdad was not a big city until uh, the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, so this uh, difference between uh, the countryside and the cities uh, is uh, extreme, for instance, in Jerusalem. So uh, at least until uh, two or three decades ago, the dialect which was spoken inside the city walls was of the urban type and was really very, very different uh, from the uh, villages which are here, uh, like in Silwan or Mount of Olives. So, this is uh, really intriguing that uh, people have kept uh, their different dialects, although they were living uh, side by side. Another in important factor for understanding the linguistic geography of Arabic is the knowledge of the history of settlement. As I told you, there is a sharp dialect border in Middle Egypt, south of Asyut. Uh, you see here. the Nile Valley there, you see nothing special. So the Nile is here not different from 500 kilometers to the north or to the south. There is uh, no rocks or something or uh, waterfalls. So it's the same, the same landscape. So uh, this means that this border cannot uh, be explained by geographical features, but uh, the reason lies in the 14th century when Upper Egypt was almost depopulated by a plague epidemic. And so later, Bedouins settled in the empty villages and brought their dialects with them. Uh, there are uh, striking similarities between the Yemeni dialects and the dialects of Morocco and formerly uh, the dialects of uh, Andalusia. Uh, on this map, you see, for instance, the uh, noun fa for mouth. Uh, you find this noun only here in Yemen, in and Andalus, and in Morocco. And uh, this we can uh, explain by the fact that uh, in the, the army uh, which conquered the, the West in the in the seventh and eighth century uh, consisted mainly of uh, soldiers from Yemen. Now, uh, the last part uh, of my lecture is about typology. Uh, all Arab, but also many non-Arab scholars regard the modern dialects as simplified varieties of standard or old Arabic. And because of the loss of the case endings, they show many tendencies towards an analytic language type, while classical Arabic is regarded to be of the synthetic language type. So as you may know, uh, usually synthetic languages like Russian, for instance, are regarded as more complex than mainly analytic languages like English. 
As for Arabic, we will see in the following that calling the dialects mainly analytic varieties is clearly an oversimplification. Let's start with the alleged universal tendency towards reduction. Okay. Uh, you see here uh, the uh, verbal forms of classical Arabic of the verb uh, to drink, so ashrabu, I drink, tashrabu, you drink, and then in the plural, nashrabu, and then also the dual, tashrabani, yashrabani, and so on. Uh, so that means that Old Arabic distinguishes 13 different forms, five in the singular, five in the plural, and three in the dual. When we look at the dialect of the city of Tunis, we observe a significant reduction from 13 to only seven. Why? Because we have no gender distinction in the second person singular. So tushrub is for men and women alike. And also in the plural, you have no difference between uh, feminine and masculine. The example of Tunis also shows that the forms for the two first persons exhibit an alignment of the prefix, the first persons. You see that nushrub, nushrubu. So in the contrast of ashrabu, you have here nushrub. And uh, so this is typical for the Maghrebinian dialects. Uh, another uh, example of analytic language type uh, is the dual in some Western dialects. In classical Arabic, you have Jabalani, meaning two mountains, but in Tunis, you would say Zuz Isbel, so two and mountains. And also in Casablanca, you even would uh, use, sorry, a uh, linker, Zuz Dijbal, so two of the mountains. Uh, so this is clearly a very analytic uh, system. Uh, and uh, you find a similar tendency also with nominals. So the idafa of uh, standard Arabic, uh, like qalam ukhti, the my sister's pen. Uh, in Cairo, uh, you could also hear il alam bita'a ukhti. So the pen belonging to my sister, or in Casablanca, le clum bial uchti, the same. So you have here uh, a word like the English of, which means, uh, which uh, replaces the idafa. However, uh, the examples cited uh, are only one part of the linguistic reality and they are not exemplary for the entirety of the dialects. So when we go back to the first table and when we add the verbal paradigm used in Sana'a in Yemen, we find practically complete conformity with classical Arabic. So you have all the forms uh, in Sana'a which you find in classical Arabic and even uh, most of the suffixes and prefixes are identical. Only the dual forms are absent. But uh, I can tell you that these dual forms have probably never existed in the spoken language and were uh, only used in the poetical koine. And San'a is not an exception. It, it, it's not uh, an exemption. It's uh, in many Bedouin dialects, you will also find uh, this whole paradigm. And uh, when we add to this table of the duals, the dialect of Sana, you see that Jabalain is used there. So the same form than the uh, genitive and accusative in classical Arabic and also in Damascus, you would say Jabalain and not Jbal uh, name or something like this. Uh, the passive voice. Uh, as you know, in standard Arabic, you have kataba, he wrote, but kutiba, he was written. 
And uh, surprisingly, uh, this is, has been preserved in some Bedouin type dialects. For instance, in Southern Tunisia, you have Kitab and Ktib. Uh, still the same principle that you change the vowel to express the passive voice. But even in other dialects where this uh, vowel changing system has been abandoned, we do not find analytic passive constructions. We find another way uh, to express the passive voice, which is not analytic, but uh, again, synthetic. So in Damascus, you say ketab, he wrote in ketab, he was written, and in Casablanca, ktub and tktub. Uh, the only Arabic dialect, which is actually not an Arabic dialect, but the own language Maltese, uh, shows uh, analytic construction of the of the passive voice uh, because in Maltese you can you may hear irajel g makdul the man was killed but this as you can see is a calc is a copy of the Italian way how to uh, form the passive l'uomo venne ucciso so you have the word to come for making the passive. Uh, and uh, there are even uh, some, uh, not, so, not so few examples where you can uh, see a higher degree of synthetic word formation in the dialects than it is found in classical Arabic. Uh, you can see, you can say in Cairo, Fenak, where are you? But you cannot say in classical Arabic, Ainaka. Uh, you say Aina Anta. Or in Damascus, you say Kifek, how are you? But it's, there is no Kaifaki. Uh, this means you have more synthetic, uh, so a higher degree of synthetic uh, language formation uh, in the dialect. And uh, so the last example is really striking. Uh, uh, where you say in standard Arabic, uh, Ma uh, lana. You have in Egyptian Arabic ma ulti ma nash. You see, there are seven morphemes in one word, so it you cannot have more uh, synthetic character of a language than in ma ulti hal nash. And there are also other segments in the grammar of the of the dialects which show more complexity than classic Arabic. And uh, one uh, of them is tense and aspect, where numerous dialects have developed rather complex systems, which also include progressive forms and numerous auxiliary verbs. Uh, and in Moroccan and Iraqi Arabic, we find a kind of indefinite article which is unknown to the classical and also to the modern language. In Baghdad, you may hear ligate fad mobile hna. So have you found a mobile phone here? So the fad uh, is a kind of indefinite article, which is derived from fard, uh, from individual. So, uh, in conclusion, we can say that studying Arabic dialects is not only an interesting field for linguists, wherever one aims to talk to people in their real mother tongue, or if one wants to understand Arabic films or Arabic popular music, one has to know the dialect. And uh, in fact, everybody from the housemaid to the president speaks a local dialect in everyday life. But official education and politics still embrace the myth that standard Arabic is the only acceptable form for writing and expressing intellectual ideas. Of course, it has many advantages that there is one official language for more than 20 countries and more and more people are also able to communicate in uh, what I would uh, call a, a light version of Al Arabiya Al Fusha. And they also learn to understand other 
varieties than their own dialects. On the other hand, we witness a very interesting development uh, in these days because of the social media, because of Facebook, Twitter, and other social medias, the dialects have become a means of written communication. So the young people in the Arab countries, they do not send each other WhatsApp messages in Fusha. They use the local dialect for writing to each other. And we do not yet know where this tendency will lead to, but it could be a first step towards an emancipation of the regional varieties on the expense of the standard variety, which after all helps the political and cultural elites to maintain their influence. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope it was clear and not too much information.